Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and we are back with episode 89. We've got a guest back on the show. We had several episodes in a row where we didn't have a guest because we were getting ready for the AK Warrior Cup, and I was dealing with med school stuff and everything else, but we are back to normal. We've got a guest on the show this week. It is none other than the legendary Jeff Doss, one of the greatest kickers in the history of sport karate. He's going to be sharing a lot of stories from his career with you guys. But first, we're going to jump right into the news this week. I want to cover the the Sport Karate News of the Week first, and I'm going to uh, introduce a new feature here, a fancy little uh, bottom line that we got like Sports Center for the news. Uh, And then once I cover some of this news, then we'll bring Jeff in. We'll get right into that interview. And then everything is still normal. We're keeping JRP Challenge. We're keeping the history highlight. All that's still going to be in the show, even when we have a guest on. So to jump into this week in Sport Karate, pretty busy news week. Uh... Top headline is we've got a brand new team coming to the sport. Uh, Christine Bannon Rodriguez, one of the greatest female competitors in the history of the sport. Forget female, one of the greatest competitors in the history of the sport. She has introduced Team CBR, which is sponsored by the Ocean State Collision Center. So cool to see them getting a a sponsor outside of the martial arts world to help out with that team. Then I've got a list here of everybody that has been added to that team for its debut. We've got Riker Weaver, Julio Lugo, Mouse Milner, Anthony Zangari, Brandon Thompson, Catherine Tian, and Ashley Sacri will be making up the roster for Team CBR. So congratulations to Miss Christine Bannon Rodriguez. Uh, we're excited to see that team in action. And uh, we've seen a lot of new teams kind of popping up over the past few weeks as we get into this 2022 NASCAR season. It's always good for the sport to have new teams and more people involved uh, helping to make this sport better and more exciting, right? Moving on, uh, we also, this has happened earlier in the week, but we've got a Black Belt Magazine rankings update. The committee got together following the AKA Warrior Cup, looked at those head-to-head matchups, looked at those results, and then made some decisions that have caused some movement in the rankings. A couple of notable movements that I put on there, and you can also see my article at blackbeltmag.com where I went over some of the uh, key movements within the rankings. Uh, but big news was that Rashad Eugene is the new number one in men's CMX weapons. Him winning that overall grand elevates him to the top spot. Uh, and then on the point fighting side, we also get some big movers in D stacks trending up, obviously, as the Warrior Cup champion. And then Devin Hopper of Team Dojo Elite, he made some jumps in the rankings, making his debut on the Black Belt Magazine rankings because of his success both in the open weight and in the heavyweight division. So shout out to those big movers in the Black Belt Magazine rankings. Uh, this weekend, we got a lot of sport karate action going down. Uh, Carmichael Simon and Chad Cannon are bringing us the Censor Sports uh, Strike League One Grand Prix. So they got a big event going on. If you want more information about that event, they were just a guest over at Martial Arts Internetwork on Alex Dingman and our guest tonight, Jeff Doss, their show Inside Scoop. So after this episode is over, definitely go check that out if you want more information on what they're doing over there with the Strike League Grand Prix. And then, of course, we got a lot of people going down to the North Georgia Open, a NASCAR rated event uh, this weekend. Uh, So definitely make sure that you're staying tuned to Black Belt Magazine and Point Fighter Live and all these sportmartialarts.com, all these news outlets that will be giving updates from the North Georgia Open. Um, And then last thing that I've got for our news this week is that uh, Richard Plowden, coach of Team Impex and obviously father of Avery and Morgan Plowden and uh, uh, legend himself, uh, was featured on ABC7 Detroit. Uh, for his work with Kids Kicking Cancer as part of their uh, Black History Month promotion. So big shout out to Richard Plowden, one of the legends of the sport. And while I was going through all of that news real quick in the sport karate world, I hope that you guys enjoyed this new little feature on the bottom of the screen here uh, that goes through some of those news highlights. So that is a rapid fire version of the news for this week so that we can get to our main event of the evening and bring in the one, the only, Mr. Jeff Doss, great to have you on the show. Uh, how's it going, man? What's up, Jackson, man? I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to finally be on. Um, it's kind of funny how, you know, we, we've, uh, we do, I feel like we do this a lot. You and I just talk or uh, we've been on each other on some type of show. You know, you've been on our show a couple of times. Uh, we've done some uh, commentating together. We've done some fantasy stuff, whatever we, we do. So, uh, man, so thank you for having me. Absolutely. And definitely long overdue to have you on the show. Uh, So I appreciate you taking the time to come on. And, uh, you know, being on Black Belt Magazine, we do get a lot of new audience every week that isn't necessarily familiar with sport karate. So 
for those of us that aren't part of the sport karate community and know you as a super grand champion who successfully made the transition to NASCA and is one of the greatest kickers of all time. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit. Just tell us a little bit about your career and uh, some of those key highlights that you put in the resume. Yeah, so I'm from a small town of 1,600 people, um, Rustburg, Virginia, and I started martial arts when I was four years old. Um, I have Grand Slam martial arts uh, for, I guess, 13 years now. Um, so I, I teach full-time, and we teach uh, Shotokan karate, Taekwondo, American freestyle, and wrestling, um, as well as the sport karate aspect. Um, but, yeah, as far as my highlights, I guess overall it would be about 25 world titles. Um, that is NASCA, ISK, WKA, uh, NBL, um, also the Atomics Grand Slam, and um, some other ones as well around there. So uh, pretty much I've won most of the major tournaments uh, in NASCA, NBL from the 90s to the 2000s and been on a lot of major teams. So, um, you know. You know, well, I'm sure we're going to cover more things, but my my ideal thing is is kicking um, in creative forms, uh, open forms, musical forms, as well as Korean um, forms. And uh, I've also done I've done every division pretty much. So we'll probably get into that one tournament. I did uh, let's see, 16 divisions at one event. So so yeah, and then that doesn't count runoffs, grands, ties. So performances is probably like 26 27 performances at one tournament but yeah so i've done it kind of everything <laughs> that is wild and all of that is to say jeff doss legend so if you don't know sport karate you're tuning in you should be listening <laughs> to what jeff doss has to say right okay. um so I want to dive right into it and go all the way back because this is something like in sport karate, we always talk about the tournaments we've been to. And uh, you especially have a great story because you've been in every aspect of this sport. You've been a competitor. You have a school. You're obviously a coach through that. You've promoted a tournament, a very successful tournament of your own. Yes. So you've got a really unique perspective. But in sport karate community, we get caught up and always talking about all the tournament stuff. Go yeah. back before that. How did this whole martial arts journey start for you? All right. So uh, if you know me, I'm about 5'5". Five, five. I'm not a very tall person. So, uh, you know, trying to find something that would be for me for, you know, a small four-year-old uh, to get going. But I was a huge pro wrestling fan. All right. So that was my big thing was pro wrestling, uh, probably from the age like two and a half on. And um, my favorite wrestler was a guy named Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and he used to come to the ring with a karate gi top and a black belt. And so that was kind of it. It was like, all right, I'm going to be like him. He's my favorite. I uh, found a, a local karate school, um, uh, Master Lawrence Arthur. He was one of the first ones in the area to just have a big mega school. Um, but at that time, it was uh, 1988. They wouldn't let four-year-olds. So I went in there. I did a week. He was like, I don't think it's going to work. You know, I don't have a class for that age. Um, two weeks later, he said, hey, I, I got a class set up. I'm ready to bring them in. And I had already gone somewhere else, found somewhere else uh, to go. So I was uh, at a school for about a year and a half, then went to another school for a year. And then I found my way back to his cry school around Blue Belt. And that's who where I got my black belt at uh, under uh, Lawrence Arthur uh, in American Freestyle Karate. Um, I was young. I was nine years old. Uh, but I went, you know, at that time it's different. It's like, I went every single day, you know, like I went four to five days a week. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a different, you know, different aspect now, you know what I mean? With that. So, um, from there I went into, um, I got my black belt in Shotokan. I also started working on my black belt in Taekwondo as well in the, in the nineties and two thousands. So I have a well-roundedness, uh, you know, in martial arts. A lot of it though stems from seeing that at tournaments, you know, going to tournaments and seeing different styles and wanting to be like, okay, I want to learn this. I want to learn that. Um, what was great about American freestyle is that it gave me a strong base that I was flexible. I could learn a little bit of this and that, and, uh, and always taught me that there's new ways to improve and get better. So that's what was really awesome about it. That's awesome. And that's one of the things that I always preach to martial arts school owners that are kind of on the fence about should we do tournaments, should we not, is it's the the love for the the 
the martial arts, right? You want to say love of the game, but really martial arts is so much more than that, right? That gets developed by competing in tournaments and seeing those different styles. And I mean, that's the goal for any martial artist is to always be a student and continue learning, right? Exactly, exactly. You mentioned how big tournaments were a part of that journey for you. How did tournaments get started? Was that something that your original instructor brought you into or did you find it on your own? How did that all Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Like I know that, all right, so the first term I went to was a national, at the time, there was not NASCA or NBL. It was called PKL and Professional Karate League. And it was 1988. So I think NASCA actually just started the, the next year and then NBL started two years later. Um, but it was a national event in North Carolina that I went to. And at that time, like the lowest division, like seven and under. So I'm four, you know, and competing against these tall guys and stuff. Um, so I don't really remember too many great things about that event as far as me competing. But the best thing that my mom did was took me to the finals that night. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of uh, beginners that go to their first tournament, they'll just go and then leave within an hour. Once they're done, they're gone. She made sure that I was there at the event to see the best and say, all right, if this is what you really want to do and you enjoy it, let's watch it, you know, and and go from there. And I'll never forget. I saw um, two people that still are inspirations to me today. Uh, one was actually from my hometown, Seneca Luther. He was one of the first junior champions, and uh, he had a mohawk, and he did uh, his forms of like uh, Welcome to the Jungle, and he used to have like leopard and tiger print uniform, just wild and crazy. So I won't, I won't ever forget that. And the other one was John Valera, who was another Virginia native. He lived about an hour from me in the Roanoke area. So both of those guys, um, Funny how, like, I went there to see both of them when probably they were closer, you know, where I was. But both are very much a part of, you know, my journey and my progress um, and my history and my legacy in, in sport karate. So uh, as John Valera became uh, one of my uh, my competition coach later on. Uh, so, yeah. So from there, it just it just I was just hooked. Um, and then I got into watching. There's uh, back in the day, there was a tape uh, that they would put in an event called karate helps kick diabetes. And so they would bring in the top champions of NASCA NBL, and they would put it on a show to um, support and raise money uh, for diabetes. Um, Jeff Smith actually started it and was a part of it. So it was his event. And uh, like, that was my goal was like, that's, I'm going to compete nationally. So that way I can be on that tape, like, you know, John Valera and like Carmichael Simon and those guys that, and Bernadette Ambrosia that I just loved. So Really, uh, that's kind of what went from there. Uh, I started competing locally in the Virginia and North Carolina area. Where I live in Virginia, a lot of people think, oh, you're near D.C. Uh, I'm only like an hour away from North Carolina. So I went to the dojo organization and the sport karate organization in um, in North Carolina. And then I traveled um, also my instructor circuit, the Africa circuit that he had in North Carolina and Virginia. And then eventually went up to the promoters plus circuit up in uh, Maryland and Northern Virginia up there. So did that. Uh, one of the things my mom was very, uh, you know, really active in uh, my sport karate uh, journey, uh, even later on becoming the manager of uh, one of my teams. Uh, but she set up a booth and she was one of the first people to sell uh, sport karate uh, gifts, toys, and jewelry. Right. So, Back in the early 90s, it was just, you know, Century just there selling, you know, sparring gear and, and stuff like that. Not anything that's just different, you know. So she had jewelry. She had, you know, the things to say like Karate Mom. And and she had like puppets and stuff. And so she did that at all the local local tournaments and then Battle of Atlanta. And, you know, Battle of Atlanta was always my tournament that we always went to, our big one. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that I, we were at a tournament every weekend selling – selling stuff and then competing, selling stuff and competing. And it happened like that for a long time. So um, let's see. I mean, my, my journey is really like, I have a lot of stuff. So, but as far as going, you know, I did like growing up as an underbelt, I did um, always do the battle of Atlanta and we all, and we did a couple of times the, um, the capital classics as I got a little older. Okay. So battle was always the one that I, that I, we always went to. And then, in 1990, the end of 93, I got my black belt and um, I actually went to a tournament the day of my black belt test. So I went to a tournament that day 
And my black belt test was at 7 p.m. that night, and it ended at 6 a.m. the next morning. And, uh, yeah, so I just, I loved it. <laughs> black belt test right there. That's how it should yeah. be. <laughs> so so it, it was it was intense. It was fun. Um, and then from there, it was just that right before that was when I started training with John Valera about four months before my black belt. And we had the plan that, all right, if we're going to do this and I'm going to take this serious of going to his house, you know, once a week, at least driving to his house, at least uh, once a week to train. Like the goal is to travel the NASCAR circuit. So that's well, how I started. So uh, 94, uh, starting, uh, in the NASCAR circuit. Uh, the goal was my first, my mom committed to, all right, five tournaments. If you get in the top five, we'll continue to go on. And so I won the first four and got second in the fifth one. So it was just kind of one of those crazy things. Um, and I mean, be honest, like, I don't think John thought I was ready yet. I know his dad didn't think I was ready yet for, you know, my form was still kind of raw. It was like, cause I put it together and John just kind of critiqued it. You know what I mean? But no one was really used to my kicks at that time. You know what I mean? So uh, having that stand out uh, really, really, really made it, um, you know, because I was competing against uh, people like Ebony Adams, uh, Calvin Choka, uh, Jennifer Santiago, all great champions that had been competing on the national Series since they were eight. And I was just kind of, so they already had that two or three years ahead of me. Um, but it, it was cool. It, it was, it was great. Um, you know, going out to California when I was a kid and then, you know, from there, my mom was like, well, I guess we're, we're stuck. We're hooked. <laughs> we're hooked. So, uh, finished that first year in runner up in forms. Um, and then I think like thirds and fourths and weapons and fighting always in that top, top area. Um, and then the next year, 95 was when I won my, my first NASCAR title. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I, I'm learning things tonight too. I never knew that, that your mom did the whole like souvenir and like equipment thing. And yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Tournaments. That's super cool. And then a couple of things that I think should resonate with people even today, right? Going all the way back, the fact that your mom had you stay for the night show, that was the same thing that got me hooked, right? Yep. I went yep. to Bluegrass in 2006 and didn't go to the night show because we drove back home to Paducah. Uh, right. And that's one of my biggest regrets because little did we know that that would be the last Bluegrass. Right, night. the last one, yeah. But then I went to U.S. Open later that year, went to and the then, night show, and that was know. the moment that I decided, like, okay, I'm doing sport karate. Like, this is what I want to happen. Yeah. Um, and then moving forward, you talked about how, like, nobody was prepared for the kicks that you had. And early in your career, you found what it was that was your thing, what made you right. different, what made you stand out. Whereas right now, we're in an era where so many competitors do so many things that are so similar. When really, yeah. if you want to be great, you've got to find that thing that separates you. So anybody that's watched you before knows that what separates you is your kicks. Yeah. Was that intentional? Did you game plan that? Were you like, the kicking is what's going to make me great? Or did you just happen to be good at it and it work out that way? So one thing, it was a different time, you know, kicking, you know, as I was coming, the jump kicks and the, and the spins and the really flipping and stuff was just kind of getting started. You were, you know, you're seeing competitors do the round off back flip to the, to the corner that was, had started yet. Um, that really the high jumps, those guys that could do that, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, for me, it was, I could do a, a slow motion hook kick at the end of my form and a lot of people weren't doing that, you know, it was something different. Um, so yeah, I give a lot of that credit to, to John Valer for not changing my style, uh, for finding, all right, this is what you're good at. Let's just clean everything else up and make it just better to highlight your kicks. And that was the thing that I always saw from him was it, you know, he didn't go and just start flipping and being like everyone else. He said, I'm going to be fast. I'm going to do karate, martial arts, and I'll still create new things, you know? And that was kind of my thing. And that 90s kind of thing, all of us are trying to find our mark. You know what I mean? Like, all right, what is it that's going to be your thing? Where are you, are you going to be the first person to create this move? Are you going to be the first person? I mean, you've even gotten to like, were you the first junior to do a triple kick? on stage, you know what I mean? Or, you know, it was like, okay, yeah, you did it in their division, but are you going to do it on stage? You know, that made a, a huge difference. Um, so it was weird. It was like the beginning of tricking, you know, with us out, not even knowing it, you know, and 
But for me, it was, yeah, martial arts had to come first, and that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to follow what everyone else did. I was just stubborn, and I'm glad because it's kept me to be who I am. And what's funny is that even to this day when I show up at tournaments, people know who I am because I don't because I didn't blend in with other people. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and eventually that kind of came along because of I made my martial arts and my kicks stand out, but I also learned how to have that edge and that intensity and that showmanship and stuff as well that I'm sure we'll talk about. Right. But um, and yeah. I love what you mentioned about that aspect of Valera's coaching, where he allowed you to be you, right? Yeah. I feel like a lot of the reason, a big reason that we see a lot of similar styles today is because we see a lot of carbon copies of competitors from the previous generation, right? Yeah. Whereas what I've always tried to do with my students is make your own style, find something yeah. that makes you different, right? And yeah. I think what's so interesting is if you watch Lauren Carney, my coach, if you watch her form and then watch mine, you <laughs> forget that I trained under Correct. It's Correct. So when I watch you, I don't think John Valera. I right. No. Jeff Doss. And, and that is so essential to making your own mark in the sport is you have to find a way to create your own thing. Right. right. Um, and right. you did that not only through the way that your forms were choreographed, but also when it comes to specific techniques, you had some pretty unique ways of putting together those kicking combos. As yeah. far as I know, you were the primary innovator of the combos uh, where you're kicking on one knee, which is incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> um, so I got to ask, and the, if the answer is two or three of them, that's okay. But what is your favorite kicking combo you've ever put together? In a routine? Um, all right. So favorite to do um, is probably like, I, I like the twist side. And being able to move in different directions because, you know, people think it's only doing the kicks in a circle is the only way you can do it or standing. You know what I mean? And so for me to go from where I'll go side hook and move all the way one way and then go back the other direction um, or kind of just be in front and move. I like moving with my kicks. I like that. You know, um, that's what's fun. Uh, the one that I feel like is the most difficult that I've ever done, but well, there's two, uh, one was holding a twist kick standing. That's really just super hard. Um, and you know, I would do that and then I would like punch in the air. I, it was just like certain things like that. And I would do that in the middle of my, uh, com my kicking combination. So I would do my whole kick combo and then I would finish with the whole twist kick about five seconds. I would hold the twist kick. And then I would go finish with a round kick from there. Um, and then the next one is kicking on on my knee. All right. Um, it went to where it was twist kick, side kick, twist kick. And then I said, you know what? Maybe I can do the around the world kind of kick on my knee. And I did that. And then I said, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll go around and then switch directions to do opposite. And I did that. Um, and so, yeah, that one, though, like I did. If you saw my video uh, of my form. Uh, I did the, the twist kick just by itself the other day. That's the first time I've done it since probably like 2005. Uh, but yeah, my knees definitely, um, definitely, uh, thanks, Chris Gallio, uh, definitely are feeling that, you know. <laughs> so I'd have a big uh, knee knee pad and everything like that and and have to have to make sure. But uh, I don't know if I'd suggest those that much <laughs> for longevity. Um, That's awesome. But what, yeah. what, what it's a testament to is you found a way to redefine what difficulty was, right? right? Yeah. In an era Definitely. that everybody was trying to figure out how can I jump and spin more? How can I jump and do more kicks? you found a different way to create difficulty. And I right. think that that's something that modern competitors can, I mean, you're still a modern competitor, you still can, but these yeah. young competitors exactly. right now, they can learn from that, right? Exactly. Because I think that there's often this arms race to who can spend the most times before they catch their bow or who can, you know, do right. the most gainer switches before they finish their combo, right? When yeah. it's, there's so many more ways <laughs> to create difficulty. I mean, that was the problem that I was faced with when I started comboing the bow tricks I put together was I couldn't beat trickers. I was losing right. the guys that were holding their commas and tricking everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how am I going to, I can't trick. So how am I going to match that difficulty? I found a right. new way to make my forms difficult. Right. Exactly. So that's, that's something that kids, when you're hearing Jeff talk about this, this was in the height of the growth of tricking. This is in yeah. the Valera yeah. Tat Carmichael era. Right? Yeah. And then into the Anthony Atkins, you know, that, that, Steve Tarada era, you know, when I was 16 to, 
20, you know, range, like, yeah, because <laughs> that was when I was coming up with these things and be like, okay, how can I stand out um, more, you know? And so, you know, I even, I had one, you know, where I do my front kick and a punch and I look at my wristwatch, you know, stuff right. like that, you know, like, but it, it gets everybody involved. And what like, what everyone liked about it was that it was still martial arts, you know? And, and, and so I knew for me, it was like, I had the perfect combo to the judges to like it, but also pull the audience into it as well too. So for sure. And that's um, the perfect segue. Yeah. You talk about yeah. pulling the audience into it. And this yeah. is something that very often in today's game goes underappreciated. And that is the all of the extra stuff that happens around the ring, right? The character yeah. that you become, the way you enter the ring. So often nowadays we see people walk in, they do their punch, punch, front stance turn, walk yeah. up, do their low block <laughs> intro. Yeah. We, we know the formula, right? Yeah, we know it. Yeah. Drop to the back, whatever. Right. Um, but you, I've always loved watching your intros and, and I'm going to paint a picture for the audience here. <laughs> All right. you, you go for it. Right. So if you've never watched Jeff enter the ring, don't even, you don't even have to watch the form. You have to watch him enter the ring. Right. <laughs> so this dude before a division, he will take a bottle of water and slam it up against his head multiple times while key eyeing, getting in the moment. And then when he walks on stage, he doesn't he doesn't make the 90 degree turn that everybody makes. No, he does like a full like semicircle around the ring, taking this lap of the ring up to the judges, says his intro kind of over his shoulder. It's just so different and so unique <laughs> and so yeah. intense. Like it, it's it's a level above what anybody else does in their introduction. So two part question, Jeff. Where does that come from? <laughs> and then also speak to the value of that. It helps you stand yeah. out. It's, it's an essential part of being it a is. notable competitor, right? Go ahead. Definitely. Definitely. So um, what I always say is that you could have the best form in the world, but if no one knows you're competing, what does it matter, right? If no one's watching, it doesn't matter. So you have to get everyone's attention first, you know, like that's your time. Um, those that kind of like, want to go away from that or like are so worried about it. like this is your time to act a fool like they're giving it to you like and and we're supposed to do it like it's going to give you more points if you're intense you're crazy you know so so yeah so man i have so many crazy moments to where i try to do different things um but i think a lot of it comes from i'm going to go to that 99 to 2002 kind of range of being a junior competitor uh, in the NBL and NASCAR circuit, uh, around 2000 and 2001, I was doing both circuits. Um, I had just won my ISK, uh, world title in traditional forms, the first traditional forms, uh, ISK title they ever did in 99. So I did that one that won that U S open. And the year before I had debuted an NBL. So a lot of people kind of know, think that I'm NBL first, but I was actually NASCAR, then went to NBL, then, you know, kind of just did it all. Um, so, Doing traditional and NASCAR at that time helped me with my intensity. Okay, really did. And so when that kind of happened, that was when it was me getting me pumped up and smacking myself in the head and doing all doing all that. Once I started doing juniors uh, and doing both NBL and NASCAR, it was just some about our era. We were all trying to push each other. And it kind of got to be like, all right, what kind of crazy thing can we do to like get the crowd and get and pop kind of like pop your boys, pop your buddies. You know what I mean? So some of it would be one, you know, I would change my intro music every time and it would be like goofy stuff. Like, you know, like one time, you know, like we would walk in like Hong Kong Fui or we would walk into, you know, like I would do a, a crisscross song. Uh, I missed the bus, you know, or one time I would walk into ain't nothing but a G thing. and hide behind the big speaker and then kind of creep out like, uh, like wrestling, like, uh, like I was Scott Hall or someone, you know? So lots of crazy things like that kind of started it. And people like, uh, Daryl Lewis, um, people call him Gandhi, uh, and Steve Tarada and those guys, all of us really just push each other to do those crazy things. And that was where, you know, like if you see at the end of my form, I would lick my hand and, and punch down. What's funny is that for 20 years, most people finish their form with a punch to the ground right after that because of me and Daryl that we're doing this, you know, and just just to kind of 
have fun, you know. So that's where we would add in headbutts. I'm going to put a headbutt this time. I'm going to do a an elbow back fist groin grab, you know. Like we're just going to do crazy stuff. And then it kind of got where am I? How am I going to intro? So I know it's a long story, but this is fun. So like I even like would hide, get behind the judges, and there would be a table behind the judges sometimes, like barriers. And I jumped over the judges before, you know, like that, right? Or I would hide under the stage and then pop up and jump up on stage, you know? Um, so that was kind of, it. it was just like, how can we like just pop the crowd no matter what, just, and just get everyone to watch. And, and then from there it became, all right, the water bottle. And it was just, you know, I think uh, at U.S. Capitol Classics, I was doing traditional though, but I still hit myself and hit a wall. I slammed it to the ground and it popped up so hard and got stuck in my uniform. And I just remember like everyone was like, get that out, get that out before you go do your form. But that was kind of where it started. And then it just kind of became a thing. And then it was like, all right, well, what's next? All right. So I would break a board over my head before I was compete. You know, um, I would do the water bottle then the board. Then I would get some, you know, like one tournament, um, uh, bear, bear Lobby, one of my great friends, got a gallon, like a, a water jug, you know, and got like the, the ones that you, you know, like the, the big ones that were the dispensers, water dispensers. So I do that. Uh, I mean, it was just crazy stuff. Um, but it just gets everybody pumped up. Like they're so excited to see like, what's Jeff going to do this time. So, and, and again, like you said, it's important because like, really I've, I've, I've done things like that and had maybe some of my worst performances, but people were still talking about what I did. You know what I mean? And, and at the end, people still stand, get, standing, giving me a standing ovation, even though like I knew, let's just say like Battle of Atlanta 2000, was it 15? I think when we did the, um, Carmichael did the, uh, the, the top eight competitors, right? So everyone was pumped up to see my form. Everyone was, you know, I just got everyone hyped and had fun, but I knew that first sidekick that something wasn't right in my knee and it just wasn't going to be there. So from there, I just kind of said, well, let's just put it on a show. You're, you're on stage doing this form. Let's put it on a show. I mean, people were just standing ovation, loving it. But to me, that's one of my worst forms I've ever done, <laughs> but I put on, you know, put a show on, you know? And so it's just fun and it's just fun. I, I, I love it. So, I mean, if you watch me compete, you can tell I love it. So <laughs> no, that's certainly true. I, I can see how much fun you're having anytime you step in the ring. And we're going to get to kind of what brought you back to come compete again. We're going to get to that yeah. later. Uh, but I think that that's a great message for any competitor to hear is that if there ever comes a point where you're not going in the ring because you love being up there and putting on a show, then you shouldn't right. be going up there, right? Right. right? And even in those forms where you feel like that might have been your worst form ever, but you still did well and got the crowd into it, it at the end of the day, the purpose of what we do on the forms and weapons side of sport karate is to put on a show. It doesn't matter if you're doing traditional CMX or otherwise, you're right. going out there to entertain. Whoever entertains the most is the person who's going to get the highest score because the judges are just spectators with purpose, right? Yep. So <laughs> that's right. The best show for them. That's, that's what's going to get you the win, right? So right. My, my favorite Jeff Doss thing of all time <laughs> is the intergalactic form, specifically yeah. – the hand puppets of yeah. the galactic form, right? <laughs> and, and I want to get into the, the thought process behind this and a lot of these decisions, right? Yeah. Is that something that's like a spur of the moment? Like, hey, I'm going to go out to intergalactic this time and I'm going to do this hand puppet thing? Or is that something that was more planned or was anything like that ever planned? Not, all right. So it kind of evolved um, where, kind of like what I was talking about where Daryl Lewis and I were just, challenging each other to what next thing can we do that most people wouldn't expect us to do in a form that we can make work and and look cool in an open form so my thing was getting low in the stance and doing the you know at the time the hot form on mbl and aska was go to shio show or go to shio die right and so you get into that deep stance and the way that gabe Naga or butch tokasala did it you do it with your hands and you do all this. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do that in an open form. And then as my opening, you know what I mean? Which, you know, openings are something that people don't really do much anymore uh, in open forms. But you would have a good 10 to 20 seconds of moving your hands, of setting things up to getting everybody pumped up. So that way they're ready to see your form. And so 
I just was there. And I was like, you know what? And this was at Diamonds 2000, 2000 and, no, 2000, Diamonds 2000. Our division had 30 in there and it was um, 16 to 17 and everyone was there. The best of NBL, the best of NASCAR, everyone was there and it was so much fun. And I, I didn't even have the, the music yet. I just know that at that point I did this and I said, all right, here we go. And so I just went like this and just started talking with the hands and then snatched one and then went right into the form. And then I added, you know, headbutt and then just crazy things and, and holding my kick and holding the twist kick and doing all this and that. And from there, it just kind of was like, you know, the place went nuts. You know, it, it was crazy. Um, then it was kind of like the next day, even without music, people wanted to see that. So I did that. And then I debuted Intergalactic at Super Grands at 2000. And that was the first time that I'd done that because it was just crazy how it just worked perfectly, you know. And if people don't know either, you know, like NBL was really known for choreography for music, right? Mm -hmm. So it was cool because I was hitting the beats of their, of their voices, which is completely different than most people were doing, you know. Like I was hitting the lyrics, uh, which a lot of people would hit the beats. So that's what was really cool about the Beastie Boys song Intergalactic and that. And but what wasn't cool was just how long my form was. <laughs> Literally, my form was two minutes, like straight of active stuff. And uh, yeah, eventually, as you saw me do it later on, I, I would have to cut that out because <laughs> it, it, it was just nuts. But um, so it started then and I did that for about two years. Uh, and, I, and it was just funny how how much pub i got it but i really probably only won maybe two or three events with that form and then about eight years later yeah about eight years seven eight years later i brought it back and just you know i started being really successful with it on the nbl circuit so again. yeah that's like my one of my all-time favorite jeff doss videos is the yeah. super grand's video of you doing intergalactic and in fact it might have been Trying to think of what year the video that I always watch is from, but I feel like it might have been when you brought it back. I feel like it wasn't 2000, but no, I, it probably wasn't. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I really loved that form, right? So we yeah. bring up Super Grands and Super Grands, like you know, I was always an ask a guy. I did a couple of NBL tournaments that I was like teaching a seminar at, but never yeah. like went to Super Grands. But when I was a kid, a lot of the YouTube videos that I'd watch, you at Super Grands and a hundred videos of Casey yeah. at Super Grands, right? Yeah, so, Josh Durbin, those guys, yeah. Exactly. So tell yeah. us a bit about the entire Super Grands experience because it is so different from anything that us NASCA competitors uh, have it ever is. experienced. It is. And so it, it was really tough for me um, as Super Grands is always uh, at either, when I was growing up, it was either uh, one uh, a full week in November or a full week in December. Um, so you have your whole season, you build points, you know, and then about August or September was the last tournament. Then you have two months off to train for Super Grands. And for me, being doing NASCAR, it wasn't like that. Like the in, the season ended around November and December was when you're off and you're resting or getting ready for the next one. So that kind of was a little weird for me, you know, as far as how to do that. It took me a long time to be successful at Super Grands uh, because of just get, figuring it out and figuring out the uh, the way the points work, you know, um, because there was different conferences. So you had a national conference with like three tournaments in it and you had a regional conference with three tournaments in it and another one depending on where you lived or where or, or you could travel and go to as many as you want. But figuring out that like, okay, you can't just go to one conference in one term at one conference, one in another conference, you know, like you're just competing just to compete and you're not really getting seeds. So figuring that strategy out, it was a difficult thing. And I think it is for many people uh, because I know I got first or second at every tournament. And then I still end up going first or second in the, you know, and it just didn't make any sense is because I wasn't securing a number one seed in a region or in a conference and stuff. So, once you do that, um, then you compete that, you know, at Super Grands. Um, it's a week-long event. They every, And what they did was the top two in the division moved on to the finals. And so you went uh, for your world title on stage against another person head-to-head. -head. 
So um, pretty much like double elimination, you know, for fighting, it was double elimination for forms. It was, you know, if you make that top two, you know, go out there and go, go all out uh, for, for on stage. Um, and what's weird is, you know, like I had one uh, in 99 or 95 NASCA in 99, I won three NASCA titles with my traditional form, uh, the overall uh, traditional, the overall grand, all that stuff. Um, and then in 2001, I won the WKA uh, world title in musical forms over in Vienna, Austria. Now, again, I was doing intergalactic in the States, but that form was not going to fly at the time in Europe. That They would be too traditional for that. So I did uh, Moni Moni, which some people have seen a video of that. That's out as well. Um, so that was real to the beat and everything. But they just were not, they weren't ready for this <laughs> at that time. Um, but I um, I actually made it, didn't make it to stage for Supergrands until 2009. Um, I went to Supergrands from 98 till that time. I made it to stage at Supergrands for continuous fighting uh, two years in a row, uh, 17 to 18 uh, 2001 and 2002 and it got runner up. Um, but I, you know, I love doing continuous fighting. It was just fun for me. Uh, but it was just a weird thing. Like I was saying, it just, it just didn't quite hit. I had probably the most third places of anyone, uh, for a long time. And then when it finally clicked, it was just, uh, it was awesome, man, because it was just like, all right, let's do this form that everyone loves and everyone likes it. But for some reason, it's not going to win. Everyone thinks it's not going to win. And let me just show everyone that it can and it will. Mm -hmm. um, and so it did after, uh, you know, I tied um, Josh Durbin and I went head to head against each other. We tied two times in the division. So like we were first and second. They made us do it again to figure out who went first and who went second. We did it again. We tied again. And then they pointed and I won. Then we went back on stage again and had to do it one more time. And then I finally won my first NBL title. So, uh, so yeah, it, it was just a, an awesome experience. Uh, the other thing is I actually fractured my ankle a month before that. Uh, so I literally, before I flew, uh, I got off the crutches about a day before my flight. So yeah, I probably shouldn't have been competing, but yeah, I just wasn't letting anything stop me. So <laughs> That is crazy. And I love hearing that perspective of, of what Supergrants is because it seems like for like NASCA competitors post 2010, it, it's like this black box of like, what yeah. is Supergrants? Like what was going on over there? How does that work? Right. How does it work? Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. So switching back to our NASCA crowd, which yeah. if, you are, if you are part of the NASCA crowd, you should 100% be familiar with the name John Valera. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've ever done sport karate, period, you should know John Valera. But, yes. Uh, so we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but you mentioned training under him and him being one of your competition coaches. Uh, yeah. Just speak a bit about that experience, because in, in many people's eyes, <coughs> you can make a legitimate argument that he's the greatest CMX competitor yeah. of all time. Right. Correct. Correct. So talk about training under him and learning. from him. So um, he came up in the same system as me in American freestyle karate. Um, so we have similar uh, like our my instructor is his instructor's instructor. So uh, we come in similar, similar backgrounds that way. Um, and so I just looked up at him. I knew he was the top junior competitor uh, for, you know, for years. And it was just one of those things that like we would go there and just, and just train and train and train. And that's where I learned about breaking my form up into sections um, and focusing on like just the speed, you know, and, and that was the thing. Um, was getting my form faster. Um, especially at that time, that wasn't really a big, a big thing in forms at that time, that 92 to 94, all the forms kind of had a similar tempo, but John always made sure that I was like trying to be faster, faster, faster. You know, I would do my, my section, you know, you have your form, you break it down to four sections, you do your section. As soon as you finish, you run back to the spot, do it again, run back to the spot, do it again. It's like no break. Uh, and you would do that three to five times. Then you'd give yourself two minute break, go and do the other one, go and do the, you know, um, that really is what helped me. And then the other thing was plyometrics. 
Um, so people always ask me, how do you get your kicks to be the way they are? And when I tell them plyometrics, they're like, yeah, that's for your jumps. I'm like, no, that's for your explosion no matter what. I don't want to be just a kicker that just puts my leg out there in the air. Um, I want to be flexible, explosive. Like I want to look like I'm hitting someone. And because I'm a martial artist, I don't want to just be like, you know, the person that can perform, but then not defend myself. So, um, so everything has to have power and speed. Um, if you see me compete sometimes, yeah, I will hold my leg up there, but I'm not going to sacrifice my technique to do it. So, because if you turn your hip over in a side kick, there's, there's a limited amount of time that you can, <laughs> you can hold it. You know what I mean? But if you turn your hip a little bit, just the other way, you can hold it out there and hold it for, you know, a long time. Um, so those types of things were what John really helped me with, uh, the plyometrics, you know, and then just knowing how to like, just capture an audience, you know, like there's nothing like his final performance where everyone is waiting, like, where's he at? Where's he at? And he just takes, you know, a good long minute to even get on stage, but everyone is attracted to like, Whoa, this is John Valera, you know? And it's just like, it doesn't take much to, you know, to capture audience if you know how to do it, you know? So, um, for me, that's kind of where I get a lot of that was from him, but making it my own way. And then, um, my eyes too, I think is a, a big thing. Um, because if you, those facial expressions, turning your eyes just a certain way that just locks them like, Whoa, like, you know, so, so yeah. So, I mean, just overall, I mean, he taught me so much, uh, but really how to train as like a real competitor, you know? So, and yeah. I love what you mentioned there at the end of that, talking about the eyes, talking about something as simple as in that famous retirement performance, waiting a minute before he came right. up on stage. It's the little things like that that can suck everybody in and make your form that much more exciting, right? right. Obviously, right. you can't wait a minute to go on stage every time. But the little right. things like yeah. the, the way that your eyes are, and it's one of those things, it's so hard to put it into words. Like, what, what do you mean the way that your eyes are, right? But right, right, right. when you see it, it, it transforms a competitor, right? And I think that, that is so huge. So Correct. we talked about you competing in a lot of different places. Obviously, Valera was a huge influence. Over your years of moving around between different circuits and capturing these titles, represented a number of different teams along the way, um, yeah. and some of them very prestigious and impressive. So go ahead and kind of take us yeah. through the the Jeff Doss <laughs> chronology. Yeah. Teams. So, so for me, like my – I think my first team was a team called Freestyle, and it was actually uh, a Mike Kelly uh, team that who later on, you know, had Team Pro Rank. Uh, but before it was, it was him putting together Kingston Ng, uh, Daniel Spalding, uh, Jeff Durbin, uh, myself, and um, a couple other competitors like Mindy Kelly and and stuff. This was like '96 or something, you know. In uh, the end of '96, though, uh, Team Elite. Uh, offered me to be on the team. So Spencer Arrington uh, was the, um, the sponsor. And he, this is right after a famous team called Metro kind of dissolved. So we were putting together a big team. Uh, so many legends like Terry Kramer, Tony Young, Ibi Abdallah, uh, Anthony Price, uh, the Santiago's, uh, Jody Tension was, this was his first big team. Uh, all of us were kind of Jesse Ray, um, Akin Williams, uh, so many people, uh, either got their first start with team elite, or this was like their last team to kind of finish their career with. Um, so from there until 2000, I was on team elite. Then it changed. We just changed our name to the sponsor name, which was CJB. And that was until the end of 2004. Um, so I was with them for nine years um my mom was the manager um for eight or seven of those years something like that um we had coaches like jeff smith uh we had mike conroy uh wilburn king and so this is where like my relationship with mike conroy really um you know evolved and he um became a, an awesome mentor and coach and, fr and friend to me so um i mean and there's so many names, you know, like Claire Cocosa, Trevor Nash, uh, Jason Tanks and Borelli, 
uh, Karim Belanger, John Sue, um, so many, uh, Stephanie Flowers, uh, so many great competitors that were on those teams uh, with me. Um, and we had fun. I mean, it, it was just, it was a family. And, you know, like one, one year we were sponsored for 25 events and that was 2001. Um, and we were gone all the time. And we even went on a cruise and uh, as a reward for being the number one, for being undefeated in um, team fighting for like over a year. So it was just, just crazy. You know, Damon Gilbert was on there, Renee Perot, so many great, great people. Um, but yeah. And so once that kind of happened and it stopped, I was in the middle of college. Um, and so I really focused on just going to events that were closer to me, which was the NBL circuit. Um, and so I, I focused on that and I was kind of doing it all on my own a little bit. You know, I would, I would, uh, go and train with, uh, Corky Sykes and his team some, and I would be on, uh, I would be a, with a team in North Carolina called MVKC and train with them and stuff, but nothing like a real sponsored type, type thing until, um, 2010, where at the end of that at Super Grands, I represented team proper. So, uh, this was their first foray into having a forms competitor that was open style. They had some traditional guys. Um, and I was also the only East coast competitor on the team as well. Um, so they were trying to do more. They were doing big NBL events and trying to transfer over to NASCAR. Um, and then from there, it was just like, all right, that was when I was putting my school out and my school team out and following the, the NBL circuit, as well as I was being a promoter. Um, and so my year, my, you know, my focus was representing Grand Slam. So that's what I did for those years. And my com competition kind of went down some too, because we had rules in NBL. It's like you, we had our conference. So if I was a promoter in that conference, I couldn't compete in that conference and I couldn't compete in another one. So I would compete out the West coast some, if I wanted to keep competing. Um, so there was just a lot of things like that. You know, I was trying to be a promoter and stuff. So I kind of went down a little bit on my competition. Um, I would still compete. I still don't think there's been a year, maybe only one year where I didn't compete a full year. That might've been, you know, the pandemic. And even then I did a couple of virtual ones. Um, so even when some people say, Oh, you're back competing. I never really stopped competing per se, but it was just like, at least at that high level of doing the NASCAR events or doing the other ones. Um, because, you know, I couldn't compete at the NBL ones anymore because I was, I was, Either, either the promoter or eventually helping run the league uh, at a certain time. So, so yeah, so it, it's just, um, and then also if you're trying to be a promoter of one league and going competing in the other league, it's, it's a little <laughs> weird, right? So, so that, that kind of stopped me a little bit around 2015. Um, I was also on Hayabusa for a little bit. Um, and now I'm currently representing um, team Heartland South. So I'm a, a, a advisor for the team as well as competitor. So. <laughs> that's awesome and that's exactly what i was looking for i wanted you to talk about those team elite days because that is such a, an iconic team with such an incredible roster i had no idea they sponsored 25 events and a cruise that one season i mean yeah. that's <laughs> uh, so thank yeah. you for sharing that and then of course back like you never left now on heartland working as an advisor for that team as well uh just su such a cool story uh, all the teams that you <laughs> represented and that's yeah. really how a lot of great sport karate competitors have done i, I kind of have a, a bizarre experience in the sense that i was on my coach's team and then it rebranded and then i was on paul mitchell so it's like right. my entire career has been i'm going to get on paul mitchell and that's yep. it exactly. uh, so it's always interesting to hear people who were around when there were um multiple of those right. heavily sponsored like huge teams with big name players and, uh, yeah and it was weird too for me because i've always been the forms competitor on a fighting team that's kind of mm -hmm. always what i was i was the forms guy on cjb or elite or the forms <laughs> guy yeah the forms guy on hayabusa or the forms guy on proper it was just like you know like you know i wasn't on a forms team you know like that was just just you know and and i always connected with the fighters more so like that was it worked with me you know it, it worked for me so Right. I found myself kind of that way too, especially yeah. in my early years of Paul Mitchell. We were having a lot of turnover on the team. 
uh, you know, Caitlin retired and Kalman and Matt all around the time right. and all were added to the team. And so I frequently roomed with the fighters, right? Like early on, we picked up uh, Justin Ortiz and Cash shortly after I was added to the team. Uh, so like I would room with them and then rooming with the Hungarians when we picked them up. Uh, so yeah, I, I did a lot of that as well and always yeah. really enjoyed it. Uh, so now I want to get to in the, in the later part of the show here, I want to talk about some of the things going on in sport karate right now. Okay. And a lot of our shows so far is centered around your creativity and the, and the way that you've kind of changed the game in CMX forms or what is now called CMX yeah, forms. Right? Right. Uh, so just speak a little bit to creative forms and uh, honestly, with some of the new rule changes that have kind of come out and then uh, haven't gone into effect yet, but they're being yeah. talked about and still, from what I understand, are subject to some editing. What is the right formula? And in your eyes, just let's look at the NASCAR circuit as an example. What should creative forms be? So I kind of feel like we've had this conversation on, our, on my show, Inside Scoop. You and I talked about this, I think, when we had you and Sammy on. And, uh, and I said, and what's funny is that I said that I think that we need to not limit the spins because we don't need to limit the degree of involvement in martial arts you know like the martial arts parts needs to continue don't limit that but um limit the gymnastics and the flipping and that type of things you know so i like the new rules i don't necessarily think a butterfly twist um needs to be in there and from you know what i'm hearing i'm feeling like that's probably what's going to happen it's just it's just going to be where you can do as many uh you know spins as you want uh i like that um and and again oh that's a great comment uh philip because actually that's kind of what I was saying. I would love to see creative, you know, tell more of a story and everyone um, have their own style again. You know, there's a couple people that I feel like have their own style now. Uh, someone like a Will Nevitt. I really think, you know, his his form has his own style. Um, and and someone like um, Salaf, you know, yeah. they have their own style. You know, when you see me, I have my own style. Um, and that is what... I hope people aspire to do, you know what I mean? And I understand learning what you can as a junior to, to compete, but as you're doing it, don't think that like you're just here to, to win first right now. You're here to build a career. You know what I mean? So think about as you're doing this, not just what you look like today, but what, what do you want to look like next year and the next year and what type of adult competitor are you going to aspire to be? And is your junior career leading to that? You know what I mean? Um, you know, there's great competitors like like Matt Emming to me is is one that always stands out. And and John Valera and Carmichael, like their junior, their junior accomplishments led to their adult just yes. you know, legacy, really, you know, and Calman as well. So uh so that's what I, I just think. Um, those are just you know some advice, but I like the new rules. I just think that the beef twist doesn't need to be there. I'm not even a big proponent of the butterfly kick because it's a soft style move. So that's, that's the NBL thing, you know, as I have. Um, but that was some, these rules actually are very similar to the ones that I helped come up with for the NBL when we had the uh, creative rules. So I like it. Yeah. And I think we're hundred percent on the same page with that. What surprised me, because obviously they reached out to me for me to run the story about what we thought was going to be right. for Chicago. Right. And yeah. when I was typing everything up and kind of going through the highlights to make it a little bit easier for people to digest, I initially didn't really think anything of the beach twist thing because I'm like, okay, well, illusion twist has been legal yeah. forever and illusion twist right. is just kind of like a beach twist. So yeah. I didn't even think it'd be a big deal. And then it goes out and then everybody's like, we can't be twisting. Creative. I'm like, Hey, okay. Yeah. yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. If nobody wants to be twisting. Creative, right. Just, right. Uh, but anyway, so yeah. And I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's, if we hear a B twist by itself, I think it's the combos that people are thinking about because then from there, it just becomes, you know, tricking combos again, instead of kicking combos, you know, I, and I, I still, that. and I still I think, think that, the, yeah, we, we need to have, more focused on kick combos to standing kick combos, you know, um, or at least to where that is looked at viewed as, as difficult, you know, right. And, and, and not just by someone like me, you know, like other people too. So, right, exactly. And, and that's where, so I want to transition to talk about Korean forms now too. Yep. And, yep. and I want to credit uh, Cameron Whittington for being one of the guys who's been on open martial arts tournament discussion, pushing a lot of this conversation as well. So shout out to <laughs> Um, but it, it gets it. Here's how I see it, right? 
it comes down to with Korean forms not getting the recognition it should, with single leg kicking not getting the recognition it should in creative, right? And I know that's kind of a weird connection to make, but But, as I try to sort through that, it's like, okay, is this an issue of competitors and there's not enough people that are skilled at it to make it worthwhile? mm -hmm. It's an issue of judging where the rules are fine. The judges just need to do a better job of assessing the parity between Korean and Japanese or assessing the difficulty similarities of single leg kicking to other tricking techniques, right? Or is it a rules issue and is there a rule that needs to be written? So to kind of transition it over to Korean forms, but also kind of talk about a bigger issue. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking at a competitor problem, a rules problem, or a judges problem. Um, I think it's a little bit of all three, but I say less of a rules issue. I think the rules issue is probably the lowest. Like we could say, you know, you need to require to have, you know, three kicks or one of the things that you're going to be looked at is a standing kick or your kicks will be, you know, like some type of criteria. I think that would help. Right. Um, The other thing though, is competitors are doing, so it's a judges and a competitors thing, right? Competitors are going to do what they think will win, you know? And so if it doesn't look like, you know, kicking is winning, then they're probably going to go away from it. You know, um, you look at the junior divisions in traditional forms, it's traditional. That means you can do J- Korean or Japanese. Korean's not women winning. People are doing Japanese forms, you know. Um, before the traditional or the classical style of kata was popular in Asuka, um, everyone was, you know, if they did a Korean form, it looked like Japanese with low stances or they were doing a Japanese form with high kicks. So, you didn't really know you, everyone kind of was doing high kicks and low, you know, even I did that as well with my concrete die. Um, so I think the judges part is there on that, but then also there's gotta be people and coaches like John Valera that says, do what you are best at. This is going to stand out and stop trying to be like everyone else and focus on the long term like it's a marathon, you know what I mean? Instead of the short term, you know, um, because if you want to stand out and you want to do like what you're best at, then do it and don't hold back. Um, you know, on my post on that, my comment was, I feel like the Korean competitors need to step up more. You know, mm-hmm. our kicks need to be better. If, if, if you need to do it, if you're doing Korean form, your kicks should, should look better because kick kicking is really hard. So, um, you know, for me, my, my, one of my problems, my beef was with, uh, Charlie, Charlie Lane. Uh, he would always, you know, mark of like, Oh, your back, let your back foot's moving. So I knocked you down. It's like, it's really difficult. You know what I mean? Like I'm pivoting over and over and over and over. So it may pop up, but I caught myself and, you know, I didn't bobble or, or whatever, you know? So, um, you can't put, I do think that like, all right, if you're in a front stance and your heel comes up compared to if you're a one leg and you're kicking and your foot comes up a little bit, the difficulty is way different. You can't, you know, you have to look at, at that technical side of it. You know, what I like to tell people is, all right. So I did a, a form at, um, at the last tournament, uh, moon moon, which is a very difficult form, slow motion, oh, foot wow. kicks, spinning around. And it's, it's insane. The best person in the world at that form, uh, this guy's name is Suska. You watch this form there is some balance check. There are some things like that. He's still the best in the world at that form against people that are doing that form uh, or doing other forms because they understand the difficulty of it. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. I don't think it's going to be perfect where I just, you know, like going to spin around in a full almost 360 uh, and not have a little bit of maybe my foot may do this, or I'm going to have to turn a little bit. I may slow down and something like, it's difficult, you know, like that's the whole point of it is to do the motion of the technique um, and to demonstrate your kicking ability. Um, so I just think in, and the reason why people don't do those forms is because they know that if there's one little bobble or one little thing, this going to be, you know, cut, you know, cut down. So I, I just think that, um, 
you just got to try. You know what I mean? Like if, if what is your goal to compete? You know, yes, if it's to win, but when, how, you know what I mean? Like for me, it's, it's to do, it's to bring things back that are not the, you know, like creative forms and kicking and Korean forms, you know, like those are my goals to co- why I'm back competing is to, cause you know what? Sometimes it's not always to promote promoting may not be the, the way for me to, to help the sport. Right now, you know, it's been the past three years doing Inside Scoop, doing the uh, the podcast, you know, which has inspired a lot of people to do that and sparked a lot of the conversation that we're having right now with the promoters, you know. Um, I thought it was, you know, to run a league, to do this and that. You know, right now, I think it's to inspire people to, like, do something different, you know, and to to really get the Korean competitors out there competing more. Um, and that doesn't mean I have to be the best. I would love to be the the one, you know, you know, out there doing it um, and pushing for, you know, a Korean challenge division for juniors and stuff. Um, but, you know, if it's other people that end up beating me, that's great because that's just going to make me better, you know. So um, there, there's, you know, at Joey Castro at the last tournament had 16 private lessons, right? 16 private lessons at a tournament, right? That's amazing, right? Yeah. We need that for Korean forms, you know what I mean? And there needs to be that want for someone to teach people how to do it, for someone to, to you know, and not just one person or, or multiple, you know, like, you know, and for me, when I stopped competing a lot on NASCAR around 2015, I felt like I was pushing that way for Korean forms. Uh, in, in the NBL circuit, I had ton, you know, about 10 competitors that were not mine. And then uh, not from my school that I was teaching privately. And then also all the ones from my school that were doing Korean and everything. And we were beating the Japanese competitors on the NBL circuit. And at that time, you know, the Japanese competitors on the NBL circuit were just as, as high level because most of those guys now do NASCA, you know, and are winning, are winning, uh, you know, the circuit. so I know I'm random and everything, but it, it's, it's a passionate thing. You know what I mean? And I just think overall, don't make excuses. Don't let the, well, they don't know, or they don't do this. Get out there and keep competing and change will happen, you know, because, you know, it, it, it wasn't, no one knew when Jared started, Jared Liker started switching and doing Super Impe or Joey Castro started doing these forms. It took them a while, you know, so you got to take the, the long run, the long road, road, you know, so. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. And I I think in particular, you hit the nail on the head talking about competitors are always going to do what it takes to win. And competitors know that if they do a form like a moon moo and they have a little stumble, that that's going to be a hash mark on the judges scorecards. And this is potentially a hot take, but I don't don't care. I'll make this public. I don't like the hash mark method of judging at all. And it is what's used by the vast majority of judges where if they see a mistake, they put a hash mark and then whoever has the least mistakes wins in principle, right? right? Of course they look at it and they use some logic, but at the same time, it's like, well, if a hash mark is for my foot was bladed and a hash mark is also for when my hand came off the bow, those two things are not the same. Right. 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 So I think that the the hash mark system is is flawed and it's something that I hear is often (laughs) a way to judge. And I'm like, "Eh, it might Mm. not be the best way to go. Right. And I also 100% agree it falls to the competitors, right? Because in my experience, looking at just the last decade, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at guys like Ariel Torres and Mason Stowell and Joey Cashman. Right. In the adult division, outside of Jeff Doss, we have not had a Korean forms competitor that is at the level in their Korean form as those names that I just mentioned in their Japanese form. And I think that that is where the root of the problem is. Is that we've had and I appreciate being, you know, in that, in that. Thank you for including me. You know, that's what I, I had hoped, you know, to be. And and I hope that I inspire others to do that too, you know. Um, and that's why, you know, I still have some work to do. So, um, but again, like I said, I have to push myself. Like I could have said, you know what, I know I'm going to do OG and I'll, and I'll do it and it's going to be solid. But I just said, you know what, I'm going against Mason. Why not do this for him right now? Like, why not? And then if I continue to do it, it's going to get better. The problem is, is if we don't do these forms, like stop worrying about every little 
thing. Oh, it's not going to win this. Well, I hate to tell you, but the form that you're currently doing probably isn't going to win either. So <laughs> do the most difficult one and like get that rust out, get the, you know, because you can practice it all the time you want at the dojo. It's not going to be the same. It feels completely different, you know, uh, on stage and, you know, and doing it. So. Uh, again i think you hit the nail on the head with a lot of that and you are certainly leading the way for the korean division and, and i and i know others appreciate all the activism that you do for sport karate not just with your own interest and in what you think should be better like the, the the single leg kicking and the korean as i agree with you it should be but the whole sport trying to lift it up through what you do with inside scoop you mentioned inspiring others to do this inside scoop is what inspired me to start a podcast right awesome. Uh, awesome. so cannot give you enough uh, appreciation and give you your flowers for that uh awesome. for our jack sweet podcast fans that always tune in we got two more segments yes. that we're gonna <laughs> do real quick uh because we, we got into some discussion there and it went a little bit over time but that's okay yeah. uh i'm gonna go ahead and get to sharing my screen right away here so that we can move on to our history highlight this week. Yeah. His name has come up multiple times in the show already, and I'm going to share my absolute favorite video of John Valera. All right. As soon as I navigate here. Here it is. All right, so we're going to share screen. I'm going to go full screen on this. And then this is 1998 U.S. Open. This is uh, U.S. Open. Their YouTube channel does this thing where they uh, post up some like classic performances. I don't think they posted any recently, uh, but there's definitely some good highlights in there. Um, and this is actually where Valera gets involved in a tiebreaker. Jeff, I have to assume you've seen this one, right? Yes, I was there. I was there. Yep, this was great. Um, yeah, I love it. Um, John, you know, talking right now, um, just – Smooth talker, real quiet, you know. Um, but when you see John again, a short, short guy, just the hops that he have is just insane. <laughs> Absolutely. And then here's what Jeff and I were talking about earlier with the presence and the intensity. I mean, you see there the minute that it cut to him doing his form, he was a completely different person, right? And that ability to become a different character is so valuable to being a great forms and weapons competitor. Yep. And, the, you know, and just, yeah, just showing the, the strong technique, the strong stances, the clean technique, and then boom, getting ready. And this is exactly what you're talking about, Jeff, yep. with those like more suspenseful, drawn out intros. Yep. And then and takes then, off full speed. Boom, pop, you know, and then here we go. Let's see. Yep. The double leg, beautiful. The first person to do that in competition. Uh and the triple, sometimes he would do the four. And yeah, I think in the tiebreaker, he goes for the four. No spoilers, Jeff. Come on now. Boom. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, and his 540 to me is still one of the best 540s ever, as mm -hmm. well as the jump front kick. I mean, the jump front kick, the way he, you know, he did it, he would always hit it with the ball of his foot, too. Yes. Uh, just, just smooth and, and powerful. Um, seeing him, I remember watching him train there's two things he did that a lot of people don't know like the side swipe when he would he leaned back he was one of the first people ever to do that um and then and then the double leg which it's kind of like a misty flip you know like it was a, a running one um and that's what you know he did there oh we're gonna watch this tiebreaker too yeah that's what i love all about right. this video is it goes okay, right. this is cool it shows both all right yeah so he want he did a i think he tie broke with kim kim doe and richard brandon uh, for this and boom, the 720, which another great move he had. And you see how his form is a little different there with the low back moves. One, two, three, four, which is awesome. And that, that's what I loved about when NASCAR used to have more tiebreaker rounds. Now with yes. a lot of the programs we've got, there's more mathematical tiebreakers. But the yeah. fact that competitors could tie relatively frequently, but then go back up there and then add more to their form and prove oh. to the judges this is how much extra I can do. It made right. for some really exciting divisions like this one where we saw Valera and Richard Brandon. <laughs> and there he was there doing something that he uh, was the first person to do, the 542 to the knee. He, mm -hmm. he started that in 1995 and landed with like a grand chop. And that time he did it and landed to the knee. And, and that, you know, is a thing we see in uh, creative forms it's to this day still. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one of the cool things about going back and watching forms like John Valera's is that you see 
how much carries over to today, to the modern right. era, right? Um, and it, that's a testament of a great competitor. When your career can have the longevity, not just for you to compete for a long time, but then for your moves to be out there for right. a long time after you retire, that's how you know you made it, right? Right. And, and like, uh, you know, seeing those moves, those moves are ones that we should still see in creative forms with a little bit of a twist. You know what I mean? So again, you see a pop 720 or you see um, a uh, quad kick, you know, maybe combo that up into something else, you know what I mean? Or put those together, you know, like I like doing a, a, a jump scissor kick pop 720, which was, you know, something that, you know, it would be cool to see more people doing things like that. So. For sure. And I know, again, we're running over time on the yep. show. So there's your history highlight for this week. And we got one more thing to throw at you. We got the hashtag JRP challenge. All First, right. I'll give a, a shout out to our challenge winners from last week, which I'm going to pull up real quick on my phone here. Uh, so one of them is Kaylin Kowalski of Team Revolution. Had to give her a shout out because uh, the challenge from last week was to give me your top three moments from the AK Warrior Cup after I did my top 10. And I love Kalen's because it talks about kind of the three phases of being a sport karate competitor, being a spectator. And her top three was watching Jeff Doss do the people's elbow. Uh, <laughs> she also had being a friend, which the social aspect is a huge part of sport karate. Um, and she talks about hanging out with Chastity Scarberry of Century. And then, of course, Gabrielle Dunn, my fiance, um, and the whole Black Belt Magazine crew. Um, and then, of course, the reason we all show up being a competitor. And she talks about being in that killer uh, 18 plus women's division. Uh, so shout out to Kaylin. I also wanted to give awesome. a shout out for uh, Sam Brume being the first person to respond to the challenge last week. He did it immediately after the show. His <laughs> top three was D Stacks winning the cup, Rashad winning CMX weapons, and then uh, Shaquan's win in the men's forms overall. Um, so shout out Kaylin Kowalski, Sam Brume for winning last week's JRP challenge. For this week, if you want to be featured on next week's episode of the Jackson Rudolph podcast, what you need to do inspired by Jeff Doss himself, which I need to point this way for because it flipped my camera, uh, post a video of you doing any single leg kicking combination you want. I'm not just saying kick combo because I don't want to see a bunch of trick passes. One leg, stand on one foot, bust out a solid kicking combination, hold a side kick, hold a twist kick, get down on your knee and spin around. That's what I want to see. Make sure you post it, tag me, tag Black Belt Magazine, and then put the hashtag JRP challenge and go ahead and tag Jeff Doss too, uh, sure. because I'm sure he wants to see that stuff. Yes. Um, so if you want to be featured on next week's show, that's what you got to do. Once again, hashtag JRP challenge. And then uh, if, if we're lucky, I'll share some videos of that next week. I'll do a screen share and, and actually put you guys in the show. Uh, so that will do it for this week's episode. Jeff, once again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate yes, it. Any, any final comments for our audience here? No, just, just guys, just like what we said, just find the, the true you and, and show that, you know, to the world. All right. Because it's awesome. And just one little quick thing. Where does the name sushi come from? Um, it, it comes from me when I compete, I'm raw. Like a lot of times I make up my forms as I go, the intensity, everything. Um, and yes, it used to be my, uh, thing that I would eat sushi the night before a tournament. So, so yeah, so just a little thing for you guys. That's where the name comes from. So, but be, find the true you and show that to the world. That's awesome. And Mike, thank you for dropping that question in there. I definitely should have thought to ask about that. But hey, it's getting late. I need to go eat some sushi right now. There so once again, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everybody tuning in. And thank you to Black Belt Magazine for supporting the Jax Rudolph podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you hit that share button. Keep spreading the gospel of sport karate as far and wide as we can. I'm Jackson Rudolph. That's Jeff Doss. And this has been episode 89 of the Jackson Rudolph podcast. And I'll see you next time.